G'day, my name's Dev. I'm here on Larrakia country in Darwin at the top end of Australia's Northern Territory. On this episode, I'm going to discuss the exceptional story of the traditional Aboriginal owners of this continent, the first Australians. It's important for me to start by saying that I'm not Indigenous. This episode is just a summary of the fascinating literature. It's historical. So if you want to learn about Aboriginal culture, you should go and yarn with Aboriginal people. Now it's well known that the British Empire justified their colonisation of Australia by claiming that the land was technically empty, but it was not empty. Indeed, people had been living here for tens of thousands of years. These peoples are the first Australians, also known as Aboriginal peoples, and they are among the most mysterious ethno-cultures on earth. Western scientific thinking is that their ancient, ancient ancestors were amongst the first human groups to leave Africa about 75,000 years ago. They then made their way across Asia and into Northern Australia via transcontinental land bridges. But there are also very strong Aboriginal ideologies which assert that people emerged from the dream time as the world was created, which in some accounts was not too long ago. Archaeological evidence shows that humans were living in parts of northern Australia about 60,000 years ago. This supports the idea that the first Australians are the oldest continuing continuous living culture on earth. However, there is little that links these ancient archaeological remains to Aboriginal peoples today. But the status quo is that Aboriginal peoples have been living in Australia for over 60,000 years. Archaeological evidence suggests that Aboriginal people spread out quickly across the entire continent and formed groups, hundreds of them, based on the sustainable economic use of their lands. The availability of water and the abundance of natural foods determine the size of the area these groups needed to survive. For example, coastal groups in rich, wet country needed only a few hundred square kilometres to sustain themselves. However, due to extreme conditions, desert groups needed areas many times greater than this to stay alive. For instance, the Walpuri people of the Tanami Desert occupy an area larger than England itself, over 130,000 square kilometres. The first Australians were completely isolated from the effects of technological revolutions in other parts of the globe. So they had no synthetics and lived completely off the land. From this they developed a deep spiritual connection to it and this is evident in their beautiful rock art paintings and extraordinary dreamtime stories. Indeed, Aboriginal societies achieved an enviable degree of balance with their environments. But this has influenced some modern supporters to create a romanticised image of traditional lifestyles, which is perilously close to Rousseau's 18th century vision of the noble savage. I don't think people tr living traditionally would have recognised this image. In the crimes and the passions of the Dreamtime stories, the Aboriginal intelligentsia acknowledge eternal human faults like jealousy and selfishness, murder and revenge. Nor were traditional societies passive. In 1803, a convict named William Buckley escaped his guards near present-day Melbourne and lived for 32 years with the Warathong peoples. Though forbidden by tribal law to participate in fighting, he witnessed many wars, raids and blood feuds. Furthermore, between 1909 and 1929, the anthropologist Lloyd Warner estimated that in one part of Arnhem Land alone, about 10% of the male population died from organised tribal warfare. These are indications of deep tribalism. Loyalty was very much to the group and perhaps friendly neighbours. Others were objects of indifference or hostility, and there was no real sense of nationhood or what is now called Aboriginality today. The groups existed across the entire continent as a pattern of different nations. Western scientific thinking is that it took about 5,000 years for current languages and lithic technologies to spread around most of Australia. This means that the pattern of Aboriginal occupation, which existed when the British first entered Australia, may have only spanned a fraction of the total time the first Australians had spent on their lands. There are no written records, so we'll never really know when or how this pattern evolved. 
but Aboriginal knowledges are ancient. Within certain oral traditions of Aboriginal cultures, there are references to giant mammals which are now extinct, and ancient landscapes which are now completely changed. Western science has found evidence of this in the prehistoric fossil records of the continent. The enormous amount of time the first Australians have spent here contributes to the timelessness of their Dreamtime stories, which saturate the landscapes and organisations of the world with purpose and meaning. The anthropologist Bill Stanner called the Dreamtime the every when, because Aboriginal ideologies see it in the world completely, everything being related back to the ancestral spirits who created it. Hence the saying, following the dreaming. I can say from experience that life in the bush is marvellous but very hard. Without modern comforts like refrigeration, air conditioning and mechanised transport, most of Australia is a very hard country to live in. It requires a diverse and innovative set of skills and almost superhuman intuition and endurance to survive. The history of the bush shows us that those without these abilities are doomed. So I think the first Australians are exceptional because they thrived in this hard continent forever. However, the strengths, ideologies and knowledges they developed during eons of isolation from the rest of the world became deadly vulnerabilities when they were encountered by the world changing forces of an expanding British Empire. White men in strange clothes with stranger animals and the strangest array of gadgets. People whose very way of thinking was so very different from their own, like aliens from the other side of planet Earth. What followed was Australia's colonial expansion. Throughout the 19th century and then into the 20th century, it spread apocalyptically across the south and then the north of the continent. It was a strange process which affected the first Australians across the continent and followed similar sequential phases of conflict and massacre, intimidation, suppression and assimilation. But there was resistance. Indeed, Aboriginal warriors like Pemaway, Yagan, Jundamara and Nemalak all fought like demons to protect their countries. It is now known as Australia's frontier wars and it is evident in the bloody foundations of Australia's famous outback regions, North Queensland, the Gulf Country, the VRD and the Kimberley. Once the fighting had finished, there began an era of heavy-handed government policy making which controlled the lives of many Indigenous peoples. Upon federation, a new Australia tried to assert itself as an Aryan nation and in this strange world, the first Australians were denied basic civil rights. Aboriginal stockmen worked long hours in terrible conditions on outback cattle stations. Most notably, mixed race children were forcibly removed from their Aboriginal parents in what became known as the Stolen Generation. Almost two centuries of colonisation has destroyed so much Indigenous culture and language in many parts of Australia. I think it is the greatest tragedy in Australian history, but their endurance and determination has enabled them to survive into an era of changing perceptions of Aboriginality. Modern Australia has come a long way in recognising that it has an Indigenous spirit and addressing Aboriginal disadvantage has become a national challenge. But reconciliation is not a destination, it's a journey, and the struggle continues today with the Uluru Statement from the Heart which seeks to create a treaty between the Australian Government and all First Australians and to start a process of truth-telling about the darkest parts of our history. This episode was influenced by the anthropologists Bill Stanner, John Lawrence and Peter Sutton and the books Far Country by Alan Powell and Frontier Justice by Tony Russell. In this episode I've tried to balance between the Western scientific way of thinking which isn't that old, and the timelessness of Aboriginal ideologies. So for the next episode, I'm going to head out bush and have a yarn with my brother-in-law, Joshua, who's an Ajumutna man and a traditional owner of some very special country in outback South Australia. Thanks for watching. If you're interested, then please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Cheers.